now, I'd like to introduce to my friend and a longtime friend of Hollywood Historical Society, the curator of Boca Raton Historical Society, and a long, long time member. Um, to uh, she's going, she's written several historic books. were on display, and she's going to tell us about the flood of 1947. What a nice group we have here today. Um, I um, started, I, I, I actually am a Hollywood gal with the Hills when it was new. <laughs> um, moved here in 69, um, but my mom is, uh, was a native Miamian and she remembers this event quite clearly and we have a couple of survivors here to testify for us today. Um, uh, in uh, the 80s, I started working for the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society. I was there for 15 years, and, and that led me to write a number of books on Broward County and Fort Lauderdale history, which you see here. For the last 20 years, I've been the curator at Boca Raton Historical Society, and believe me, both those communities and every community in Broward County was affected by this event. That's pretty good, Adam. Okay. Thank you, my dear. 1947, the year it wouldn't stop raining, as what the old timers call the flood of 47. So a little background and a disclaimer. I am not a geologist, I am not a hydraulic engineer, I'm not even environmentalist, I'm a historian. <laughs> but we need a little background to put this all in perspective. We all know the Everglades is out there, we all know it's a lot bigger than uh, in the, back in the day than it is now. Um, and man has impacted it greatly. In terms of taming the Everglades, what's relevant to us is in 1904, a man named Napoleon Bonaparte Broward ran for governor on the platform that the state should drain the Everglades to make good farmland, which apparently it does. So there would not be a town of Davie, which was totally inundated before, uh, not to mention Wellington and places like that, without this project. The Everglades Drainage District was created, and the first of a series of canals were constructed starting in 1906. The first one was, was is, called, is called the North New River Canal. It's off the South Fork of New River. Um, if you're on 995 and you cross over uh, the um, um, uh, Marina Bay, the, you know, the really high bridge? Okay, that's South Fork underneath you. Uh, the canal goes to Lake Okeechobee and resulted, as I said, in the town of Davie and so on. Let's look at a map in a second. So that's the man standing on the uh, building materials for the dredges. And, you know, this isn't, uh, today we go, oh my gosh. What a terrible idea, right? Everyone thought this was wonderful. No way these people could have possibly envisioned the amount of population we have here today, the need for water supply, aside to heck with all the uh, species that were impacted by the shrinking of the Everglades, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we, we live in one of the most manipulated environments on the planet today. And this is only the beginnings. Here's one of the dredges working on North Fork. So here's a couple of maps I wanted to share with you. Um, on your left, uh, and, and of course it's not to scale, um, we're looking to the right is North, okay? So the beach is here down at the bottom of the picture. Um, and this is Fort Lauderdale, which was named for a second Seminole War fort. It was established in 1838, by the way. Um, but it's a growing little town on Mr. Flagler's railway by the time our story takes place. And you can see in the circle there, the line of the Everglades, 19, 1890, so before this project began, roughly, very roughly, uh, where the interstate crosses, the interstate uh, goes through Fort Lauderdale Dale today. Uh, and beyond that is indeed, in that oval, the new Everglades Canal. To your right, I wanted to share with you, these are the canals of the Everglades Drainage District, including the South River Canal 
and North New River Canal and the South New River Canal, and the South New River Canal runs uh, along Griffin. Uh, the Miami Canal, the Palm Beach Canal, and so on. Uh, and all of these canals were completed to Lake Okeechobee. Uh, and it was possible by the 1910s to travel inland by steamboat, yeah, the kind with the paddle wheel, from downtown Fort Lauderdale, where the railroad crosses, the FEC, you know, where the Bright Line controversy is, or downtown Fort Lauderdale, inland by water to the Gulf of Mexico on a steamboat. Uh, and people did. But the main function of the canals was not transport. It, it, well, it was transport. It wasn't just to be on a cruise. Um, it was to transport um, produce from the Lake Okeechobee region to the railhead at Fort Lauderdale and Deerfield, for example, on the Hillsborough Canal. So Fort Lauderdale in the 19-teens were very proud to earn the title, the gateway to the Everglades. Can you imagine? Not the Venice of America. It was definitely inward looking. And it was all about water and controlling the water. Well, what happened was by the late teens, the, the canals had started to silt up. They weren't well maintained. They weren't well built in the first place. There was all kinds of rubble in there and so on. Uh, but not such an issue for Fort Lauderdale because in 1920, by 1920, the Florida land boom was on. So now it's all about real estate and tourism and not so much about agriculture. Just jump ahead a few years. There was a horrible hurricane here in 26 that ended this land boom, the Great Miami Storm. Uh, and that was pretty bad, very devastating on um, Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. Uh, but in 28, it was one of our worst natural disasters in the history of the United States. The Okeechobee or West Palm Beach storm came ashore, the Cat 4, uh, headed for the lake, Lake Okeechobee, pushed all the water out of the lake like a giant shallow basin and drowned at least 3,000 people mostly African-American workers, migrant workers in the area. There was no place to go for animals or people. Okay, it's just nightmarish. Uh, but, and there are several mass burial sites that still exist because they just couldn't account for everybody separately. But the result was the creation of the Hoover Dyke around Lake Okeechobee in 1932. All right, now let's come ahead to the 40s. Uh, 40s was one of those times, like in the 1960s or the 2000s, when we seem to get hit by storm after storm. It seems to go periodically, doesn't it? Um, I lived here, I lived down in South Florida in the 60s, and we, we got out of school all the time. We thought that was nice. <laughs> uh, so we have several bad storm. The October 41, Pack, you can see kind of hitting south of us. Um, the September 45 storm uh, did pretty good damage in the area. Um, at the time, there were um, many of our um, military bases, which were all over the state of Florida because of the war, uh, were still occupied. The Bogotone Army Airfield, which was a very, a very, very large installation, 6,000 acres, uh, they had to send all the personnel to the, the Boca Raton, the Boca Raton Resort Club, as sanctuary, because that was the biggest building, best built building in town during the 45 storm. So I've heard a number of stories about that. 47, <coughs> one of those killer years when it was just really, really, really wet in Florida. So Hurricane George, now let me tell you about that. So when, back in the day, we, we remember when hurricanes were named for females, right? Okay. Uh, and if you looked in the newspaper or you talked to Dr. Joan or anybody, what was the name of this storm? I don't think they would say Hurricane George, would you, Dr. Joan? You, did you hear the name George associated with the hurricane? Okay. Nah -uh. 
but apparently it was some kind of official designation, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, maybe from the Weather Service. Here it comes September 47, it's a Cape Verde style storm, those are the bad guys. 15 days as a hurricane, came ashore at Fort Lauderdale on September 17 as a Cap 4. Hurricane force winds extended from south of Miami to Cape Canaveral. The storm was loud, large, powerful, and slow moving, and caused serious coastal and inland flooding even on the southwest coast of Florida, as you can see. Uh, and the worst damage was to Hollywood and Fort Lauderdale. There were 17 deaths, and the damage is estimated at 32 million. It depends on which account you read, you know. But a lot, mostly agricultural. Here are some photos from a newspaper from 47 showing the damage. Everybody loves a good hurricane damage picture. Uh, <laughs> To your left, you can see a nice sinkhole in downtown Fort Lauderdale that formed, a tree blocking the path of a business. The lower right is actually Pompano. Uh, it's a trailer park. Now everyone knows the Lord doesn't like trailers <laughs> or mobile homes. Uh, and so he visits these terrible storms upon them once in a while. Uh, and at lower left is actually what I believe is Dixie Highway Federal was not nearly as important then. It was constructed, but it was just a two-lane road uh, between West Palm and Fort Lauderdale. Now, we're very blessed because thanks to our friend, Dr. Michelson, uh, her dad was Tony, and he was the city manager at the time. Can you imagine? I'm glad I didn't have that job. Uh, and we have this wonderful interview that she has allowed us to use talking about the, the flood of 47. Uh, I had been there two years, and actually I had been through four hurricanes. Of course, in 47, they were direct hits. The first one was a dandy. It came out of the east. I don't know whether they named them that at the time or not, but it came from the southeast, where they usually come when they hit us, and it was a pretty rough hurricane. It was not as bad as the 26 storm I mentioned, but enough to pile up about five or six, seven feet of sand in every street on the beach when it was all over. It tore us up pretty badly, but other than the sand on the beach, we had the city cleaned up in pretty good shape. It took about a week to get the sand off the beach. I was able to do that because we had some heavy equipment down here, luckily probably belonging to various contractors, like a couple of graders, a bulldozer, and less than a week's time, uh, to we turned the whole city's crew loose, getting that sand back in place again. Uh, here we have some photos from the Historical Society's collections uh, of the damage from this September storm. That's, of course, our wonderful beach hotel, getting the brunt there. This is the Hollywood Kennel Club sign. The Hollywood dog seems to have been completely dismantled. The Levant home on the beach, and you can see how the pilings are undermined, uh, and Madison Street. Um, and we have a couple of survivors, and we'll ask them some questions later on. Uh, the September storm also, I include Boca Raton, even though it's the next county, because I happen to know where deal about it. <laughs> Beat the heck out of little Boca Raton. We had this huge Army air base uh, with 800 buildings. Most of them were tar paper shacks, because it was a camp. <laughs> uh, and they came down like dominoes. And so everybody in town, there were 750 permanent residents at the time, and as many as 15,000 men stationed there. But every citizen went out with their brownie and took pictures of this same exact view. So in Boca Historical Society's collection, I will have that upper left picture. I have several of them, but they're not exactly the same. They're obviously taken with different cameras. That, it must have been quite a sensation. Uh, and you can see what happened to the hangars. Um, and as a matter of fact, the um, Air Force, which it had just become, have, was considering keeping Boca Raton as an active base installation. Uh, but the base was so damaged that they decided to fold up and move to Biloxi. And that's that was what happened. So that was a terrible economic impact on the community. 
To your lower right is the Cabana Club, uh, which is at Via Cabana itself, the Boca Raton Inlet on 81A, if, you, if you're familiar with Boca. Uh, and to your left, we have Deerfield. I think those are Kester Cottages. Mr. Kester owned a little tourist cottages in Pompano and Deerfield on the beach. Uh, and you can see they really took a beating. Well, that's not bad enough. So a couple of weeks later, we have another hurricane. <laughs> King in October of 47. And this is one of those sneaky guys that comes from the West, like Wilma and so on, Ian. Sneaky guys. Came ashore at Cape Sable October 11 to 12 and was preceded by spectacular thunderstorm activity and heavy rainfall. The greatest damage was not from the wind, but the heavy rains as much as 15 inches inland, six inches in 75 minutes. Water was waist high in many spots uh, and in parts of Hialeah, six feet deep. Supposedly, according to one report I read, this broke a world record for rainfall in a short period of time at the time. There's one death in Savannah. The damage was 20 million. And again, that's not even fully accurate. So this was the headline in the Fort Lauderdale News the next day. Davy Fort Lauderdale handed staggering blow by big storm. Uh, and the news reported, this is great. Broward County from the air today is one vast lake which stretches from a point a few miles west of the ocean, so this is inland flooding, this isn't coastal flooding, inland flooding for the full 45 miles west to Collier County where the lake continues. The vast flood stretches from Hialeah on the south, northward to the Connors Highway, that's smack dab in the middle of Palm Beach County, and beyond in Palm Beach <coughs> County covering a total area of 600 square miles. The entire Kissimmee Valley, we're talking further north, right, was a great body of water to Orange County. The St. John's was flooded to Volusia County. All of western Brevard, Indian River, St. Lucie, and Martin counties were flooded. And virtually all of Broward, Bay, Palm Beach, Collier, and Henry formed a freshwater ocean. Uh, and there's a little map of the rainfall. Wow. <laughs> Very incredibly extensive. Now, everybody who remembers this storm will swear to you that the reason it rained so much was because the storm was seeded with dry ice. C-S-E-E-D-E-D. -E -E -D -E -D. And that is, in fact, true. However, the fact is the storm was not seeded until it had passed over Florida. It was out in the ocean. It was the next day. It was seeded with dry ice by GE scientists and military uh, planes, October 13th. Uh, and guess what? It worked really well because the storm <laughs> picked up speed, grew back into a hurricane, Went out the ocean, did a U-turn, and came back and hit North Florida and Georgia. What does that mean, seceded? Yeah, they they seeded. dropped dry ice into the storm to make it rain. That is a way to produce rainfall, okay? And it did. It made it rain even more. Well, why did they want to do that? They were hoping it would rain itself out before it hit another place. Well, in fact, it just encouraged it to rain, and it, it tracked back inland instead of going out into the ocean and just rain. Uh, so that's done usually when you have a, not, not enough rainfall. That's done in some countries to encourage rainfall. But that, anyway, this was not a successful experiment. Can I <laughs> uh, uh, more from Tony. We had 17 to 18 inches of rain in three hours here in Hollywood at that time. We had a wave of water coming toward us from north of Lake Okeechobee. It seemed as though they had an awfully wet season up there, really flood stage, to a point where normally it should have run into Lake Okeechobee, but it came down to the east of Lake Okeechobee, between there and the waterways along the east coast. 
There was so much water, they couldn't handle it. So that wave of water, three or four or five feet, we knew it was coming, came right down at us. And I mean, we caught it. When I say that all through our northwest part, where Hollywood Hills is, <laughs> where they built those beautiful homes to the west of the Hills High School, along in there, those low places had as much two, three, or four feet of water coming down. That in turn filled up the entire West March, which is Miss March, which is a lower area where the Orangebrook Golf Course is, and all over that lower area where the other golf course is. We had as much as three, four, or five feet of water through there. It just filled up the whole west part of Hollywood. Uh, Don, he, who he was talking to, said, I understand Hollywood Hills was virtually an island for a couple of weeks. Well, Don, also, um, Tony remembers, even the boulevard and all the way through in the lower places had as much of a foot of water all that time. People were wading and driving through it. As I said, there was easily a foot of water all through the lake section, so that's very far east. So this is Lake Orange Brook. <laughs> uh, we all, you all know where that is, right? Just west of the interstate, Hollywood Boulevard. I have tons of wonderful professional pictures of Fort Lauderdale. So again, it was a, it, it was a, a fun activity to get out. Uh, this is New River. But where can you tell? Where is what the difference between New River and New River Drive? Hard to tell. Same thing. This is Riverwalk. Uh, so if you're standing on the Andrews Avenue Bridge, in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, this is Riverwalk. Uh, so the north side, this is North New River Drive, but west of the Andrews Bridge. Uh, over here on the far left is actually the FEC Railroad Bridge. And that's um, behind those, you can see the um, Australian Pines in the background. That's where the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society buildings are. But once again, what's the difference between New River and North New River Drive? Downtown Andrews Avenue, uh, we're standing at the intersection of Southeast, Southwest, Second Street, uh, looking south towards the Andrews Avenue Bridge. Same thing, different photographer. The photographer is standing, you know where Main Library is downtown, right? Yeah. Yes. So if you're at the Southeast corner, so that's Andrews and Second, that's, that's the view you would have. So that tall building was our skyscraper in Fort Lauderdale. It was called the Sweet Building. And unfortunately, it's no longer with us. But it was just north of the bridge. And here are the two of them. This is Birdine's when it was downtown. Today, it's the home of the Broward Government Center. But it opened this year, and you can see it was still under construction. So this is, this. if you were at the library again and you looked west across the street, this is what you would see. The main post office was is now a parking garage off Las Olas, Northeast First Street. Uh, and on the left, you're looking north, um, where it says First Federal and everything, all that block is now a main library. So those buildings don't exist anymore. We have wonderful, horrible memories <laughs> from the store. Uh, two young ladies from Fort Lauderdale told me they uh, went to the movies. I guess they weren't reading the weather report. Uh, and they came out, and there's all this water. Uh, so the fire department had to take them home. Fort Lauderdale High School was then downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, it was south of Broward Boulevard between Northeast 3rd and um, uh, US 1. Uh, one big lot. Uh, ended up being a lake. The low, they had a real auditorium, so the low points of the auditorium filled with water. So the uh, school went in, put pumps in, pumped the water out. A couple of days later, the water reappears. <laughs> Uh, and they kept doing that for an entire year. And in fact, I have the memories of students who were having class in the upper part of the auditorium 
while the bottom was a pool. Now, can you imagine? I don't know about you, but I'm really allergic to mold. Can you imagine the horrible, that would be me big trouble with ocean stuff today, right? But nonetheless, <laughs> schools, uh, they continued to meet in that poor old auditorium. Uh, in Oakland Park, which is where I live, Harlem McBride, which is the um, African-American community back in the day, was completely inundated because it's low uh, and unlivable. And people were evacuated to the Naval Air Station, which was, is today our airport. Frogs invaded houses by millions. Bass and other large fish swam through streets and yards. Sewage, now this is the real cost, sewage and septic tanks are a horrible menace. So it's not just water, it's yucky water. People had to have typhoid shots. Many state highways were closed, including US 27 and State Road 84. Jack Warner had an insurance office, 21 Southeast 2nd Street. Once again, this would be now where the library is, main library is. Uh, and um, he made it home. He comes into work, was afraid his car would stall. Um, and he found downtown one vast lake, mostly knee, knee to waist deep. In the office, everyone took up their shoes, rolled up their pants legs, and got on with it. Because a flood of people then arrived to make claims for damage to their property. So when you're in the insurance business and there's a flood, you got to show up to work. Now, this makes me laugh really a lot because the guy over on the right looks like he's wearing his boxers. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe he is, I don't know. Uh, these are pictures of Las Olas. So um, on the lower left, if you think where the art museum is today, okay, it's really much occupies this site. We're looking east on Las Olas and Andrews. And the other view, we're looking west from Las Olas to Andrews. This is where the Fort Lauderdale Women's Club is. Uh, it's called City Park, so it's just north of Main Library. There's a little park there, okay, uh, at Andrews and Broward. And no guy, you shouldn't have parked there. That's a good one. This is Dixie Court, which was a housing project for African American citizens. It, it still is, but the, the old buildings aren't there anymore. It wasn't all bad. Of course, the kids had a lot of fun uh, tubing around and so on. You see some kids riding their bikes through Dixie Court. Okay, I live in Oakland Park, and it's in a, a basin, okay? It always floods there, and we've been fighting it since the dawn of the 20, 20th century. Um, and Dixie Highway just flooded. <laughs> and we have these fantastic pictures. Um, we have the Mitchell House on 39th Street, a Northeast 40th Court from Dixie. Everyone pulled out their fishing boats. Uh, and you see people had a little bit of fun. <laughs> 4100 block of Dixie. Um, more Dixie Highway. This is Davy. State Road 84, so think 595, and State Road 7. Uh-huh. Going back, as Mother Nature intended, to Everglades. Now, a consequence of the flood, 90% of eastern Florida from Orlando to the Keys is underwater. Weary livestock escaped to local levees and any high ground they could find. They were sharing with deer, wildcats, and rattlers because they didn't want to drown either. People attempted to dynamite local dams and locks in an attempt to protect their property, turning neighbor against neighbor. Here's one of my favorites. Um, Hamilton Foreman, the Foreman Dairy was pretty much where Broward College main campus and Nova are today, okay? Uh, it was dairy, and it's underwater. So Ham and his foreman, F-O-R-E-M-A-N, Otto, uh, are trying to rescue as many of their livestock, as much of their livestock as possible, um, trying to get them to high ground, but they're in competition with the wildlife. So
So they killed 36 rattlers, and these are big mamas too, I mean, not little baby ones. Uh, just out of necessity, uh, as the rattlers tried to seek refuge in the same spot <laughs> as Ham and his foreman and cattle. This is South New River, the South New River Canal through Davie. So Griffin Road, looking east. So only where the roads are and the bur really are, that's the, not the high ground in Western Briar. Davie rodeo grounds. Pompano. Plantation. The Fort Lauderdale Boston Country Club is in Plantation. I know it's goofy, but anyway. Is that what that big building is? Yes. That is the beautiful Francis Abrea designed uh, Fort Lauderdale Boston Country Club. It unfortunately has long, was demolished a long time ago. Um, but it was built, it was Fort Lauderdale's Country Club back in the 20s. It was built in the 20s. So, um, yeah. So more from Tony. It drained, but it was slow. It would have been weeks and weeks until we got our uh, heads together, uh, and the mayor and some government officials, and we got the idea we would open a trench between the intersection of the Dania Cutoff and the Intercoastal, and dig a trench right straight through from the Dania Cutoff to the high tide line in the ocean. Well, they were allowed to do that, if you can imagine. It was, we thought it was a wonderful idea. We had a couple of drag lines and dug the trench, and sometime in the early afternoon, at the minute or second, it indicated it was extreme low tide. We opened up, and believe me, we got rid of a lot of water in a very short time. That was how we finally got rid of most of the water. Uh, and Don said, why wouldn't the water have naturally flowed out through Port Everglades Inlet when it emptied in from the Dania Cutoff? And wouldn't it have naturally have flowed northward into the port uh, and out through the inlet? Well, Tony says, the fact that we had water standing there for weeks and weeks, I guess, was due to the fact that there was so much water coming from the Kissimmee area and the effects of the storm that the various tides were affected. You see, on the only outlets we had, the closest to Port Everglades, was a couple, which was a couple of miles to the north, or at high tide it went out through Baker's Hollow, so that's Day County, and that's quite a ways down. So it was pretty slow empty. Getting rid of the water that we had in these very places that I told you about, around Orange Brook and further west. But Don, the water went off awfully fast after we got this opening dredged, and the normal tides, the low tide, carried off pretty well. And pretty soon we were high and dry again in Hollywood. Okay, well that's not enough. Okay, because in September and October we had two more hurricanes, and there was one in '49 as well. Uh, same deal, we've got these sneaky western storms. Now this is kind of fun. So I work at the Boca Raton Historical Society, and these photos are in our collection. We have quite a few, and you can see they say October 48. So when I was cataloging them years ago, I thought, those old geezers, they just forgot what year it was, right? <laughs> no, indeed, we had flooding in 1948 as well. Sue so was wrong. Uh, and that's my friends Archie and Irene in Bo Little Boca Raton, October 6, 48. And those folks were in Old Floresta, October 5th. Oh my goodness. So, the result of all this water, we're going back to the early part of the talk, was what's known as the Crying Cow Report. <laughs> <Aww. laughs> Poor old cow. <laughs> uh, uh, a tentative report of flood damage for the Florida Everglades Drainage District, 1947. Uh, and what happened was the creation of what was then called the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District in 1949. Today we call it the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, and the point of it is to make sure that such extreme flooding never occurs again. Now, my friend Constance actually works for the Everglades Drainage District. Isn't that a hoot? It's still called that. Uh, and she said, Tommy Sue, it's unlikely that will occur because 
because of our building code, and especially in our newer Western, younger Western communities, um, every developer has to allow for a place for water to go. Uh, we have swales that are required. We have basically retention ponds and things like that, just to avoid this kind of flooding. Uh, and so next, I have, let's, can we hit the lights? We have a couple of survivors here um, who might like to testify. Dr. Joan, you have some uh, memories you'd like to tell us? Well, I was, as here, here you go. was pointed out, oh, I was about 12. And in school, we went to school also. I went to, at that point, it was Hollywood Central. And I do remember the typhoid shots because then you'd go through the hall and somebody would punch your arm with a shot. Oh. <laughs> Where my father had bought land um, in the, just west of the railroad, um, FEC Railroad, we never flooded because my father had surveyed it and he knew the high ground. But otherwise, I remember you had boards across the, the sidewalk so you could walk and yeah, there was a lot of water. <laughs> Thank you. And my mom told me, I'll be, one Sorry. second. My mom told me that uh, she's a Miami girl. Miami was flooded too. Um, and she was in the marching band at Miami Edison. Uh, and they marched in the Orange Bowl, which was just a big mud pit. She lost one of her favorite shoes. She's still mad, was mad about that, you know, 50 years later. <laughs> uh, we moved from Connecticut to Hollywood, Florida in 1947. And all the way down from Connecticut, you know, you had to drive. US one, there's no other way. Um, it rained all the way. I remember stopping in the St. Augustine in a hotel or a motel with a tin roof. And you know how that was sort of me, because we were just little kids. We got here, luckily, we rented a place that was two story. So we were upstairs. But we, we were through the whole hurricane, like Joni said. Joni and my husband. <coughs> actually went to kindergarten together. <laughs> this is Michelson's outdoor school, because oh, he lived yeah. here since 1937. Mm -hmm. So I gave you pictures of, he lived on the 340 New York Street, which was Hollywood Beach. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had some great photos that I gave to her today, um, of the beach, of the seawall broken, of the uh, on their feet of sand in his front yard, and all that. <coughs> And, uh, and we remember the typhoid shots. And my father, who always thought this was so exciting, <laughs> put us in this old car, and he decided just to drive west. Oh, no, really? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you know my, and see how far we could get. <laughs> and he made my brother walk in front of the car <laughs> to make sure we didn't hit any big, deep potholes. <laughs> That's great. Uh, anybody else who has a memory? No? You, sir, you had a question? I'll get to you. Well, this isn't a memory, this is a, uh, an explanation. Yeah. Uh, the concept of using dry eyes to. Uh, here, here, here. Tell everybody. Rainfall. Belongs to a science and technology known as geoengineering or atmospheric geoengineering. And atmospheric geoengineering has reached a point now where we could actually cool the earth whenever we want to with science and technology, which is currently available. They use what are called shield molecules in the gas form. You can take a B 47 with some pumps and the gas, pump it up into the atmosphere. And for about two billion dollars a year, not two trillion, two billion, we can actually cool the earth sufficiently to avoid uh, serious global warming. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. so why are they doing it? Yeah, well, <laughs> and you I'll donate. I'll donate. I'll donate. That's right. Where the Boca Raton Army Airfield Base was, the uh, where yes. FAU is today was the runways of the base. The base, if you know Boca, that's just the runways. That was the northwest section of the base. The base went from Palmetto Park Road to north of Yamato, and that's how they said it back in the day. And from Dixie to 95, uh, almost 6,000 acres. 
huge um, air, army air base during the war. Um, I've written a book about that too. Very, very interesting. Uh, but yeah, weather was part of their, <laughs> one of the things they had to deal with, of course. Anybody else? Gosh, thank you so much for coming today.